Hi, I'm Philip Gross. I'm here representing Conica Minolta. I have uh, three talks. They're each 15 minutes long. I'm going to do in 15 minutes total. Okay? Right. Now let's get going here because i got 53 slides. Okay. I want to talk about uh, uh, Conica Minolta is the only planetarium company that runs its own planetariums. It owns and runs its own planetariums. And uh, one of the most successful planetariums in the world is just opened at Skytree. Uh, tower in Japan. This will give you an idea of the tower, how tall it is. It's the tallest radio tower in the world, the second tallest man-made structure in the world, and at the base of it is a planetarium. And uh, it's been averaging around 700,000 people attendance in a 60-foot dome. Um, uh, they're paying an average of about $12 a head, so you can see that it's actually possible to make money with planetariums. What a concept. The interesting thing about this is that it uses an, an Infidium star projector combined with two SMG2 4K projectors uh, to create a, an integrated uh, system. We don't like to use the word hybrid because we invented something a long time ago called Jimmy Star. Uh, the first one ever integrated uh, and working together was in 1994, which you saw at Coco. Um, that was with the Digistar system uh, combined with... Uh, uh, a kind of come up with star ball. So we've been doing this for a long, long time. And we're combining basically uh, JVC 4K projectors combined with the star ball in producing a stunning uh, uh, theater and imagery and it's easily the most successful planetarium in all of Japan. And then we decided to do something really weird. We made a 7K system. And you may ask, why did we make a 7K system? Well, we made a 7K system for this reason. And I, I think I find it. Here we go. Now, there are three projectors back here and one projector here, and there's, there are five projectors being used for the system. One of the problems with multiple projector systems, and you've seen them, especially six projector systems, is you almost always end up having a projector right here, or if you have a two projector system right there. And you're looking down the barrel of the projector, the bright of the projector, you know, it looks like a train. I know of several planetariums where it's really annoying every time the full dome system comes into play because the projector is here. We avoided that in terms of the attention and created a, a wonderful 7K system using that. So it's kind of a different design. Vanderbilt Planetarium just opened uh, in New York <coughs> uh, in March. Uh, we were really lucky to uh, be part of this project. This is uh, Dave Bush singing karaoke to the Japanese guys in the background during the opening night. And I hope that maybe that there will be a max meeting there. Just tell you a little bit about it. It <coughs> contains an Infinium L combined with two JVC uh, 4K projectors. The, it's integrated using SkyScan's uh, Digital Sky 2 system. It's, uh, the console is pretty easy to use. By the way, when you push buttons and turn knobs, it, it also turns the Digital Sky system. It's fully complete, 100% integrated. It's a beautiful theater. And that's what a Jimmy Star 3 looks like. Montreal, Quebec, uh, this is two, pro, uh, two domes. Uh, Skyscan was the lead on this one. They, they hired uh, Conic Minolta to do the, uh, the, the projector system, but uh, it's a full dome, uh, digital multimedia, and a planetarium system. Uh, this is what it looks like. This, you notice it's kind of black and gray. They wanted a Darth Vader machine. Most of the Conic Minoltas are blues or silvers and so like that. They wanted Darth Vader gray. And so they gave them Darth Vader gray, and it's there. And it's a, it's a, a planetarium designed strictly for astronomy. You notice it's Completely circular theater. They, they're doing their full dome multimedia shows in a completely different theater, but they wanted the, the, the full dome capability to be able to enhance a traditional astronomy program. And in uh, Hamichi, Japan, they just replaced all the star plates and the star lamp systems um, for that machine with a new LED star field. Zeiss has been doing star, uh, LED, you know, several companies have been doing LEDs. Uh, why did Conic Minolta come so late to it? And there's a good reason. Zeiss will tell you the same reason. That is, is that until recently, the amount of light output versus the amount of heat put out by LEDs wasn't very good. It wasn't very effective. We were waiting for the technologies to get much better so that they would run cooler. Cooler means no fans. It means that the star plates and everything, everything else lasts longer. And so, we decided to wait until the technology matured a little bit. And what we did, we jumped in it in full, full way. And we're introducing the Sigma. The Sigma is a projector, an LED projector, all new design. It's going to replace all our, we're only going to have one star wall. We're eliminating down all our to just one. 
It does every thumb size from 20 to 27 meters. I mean, 12 to 27 meters. One star long. Uh, complete LED. Uh, it's small, less than 800 millimeters in diameter. Uh, the price point is we're dropping the cost of our star balls in half. Because in order for you to be able to go back and do star balls, multiple million dollar star balls, just no one can afford those anymore. So we've completely reinvented and redesigned all that. Who represents Conica Minolta in the United States? Actually, it's not me. It's a company called MTE, Magnetech Electronic Company. Uh, they're the largest barcode dealer in the United States. They do more digital cinema installations with 4K projectors and 2K projectors than all the planetary companies in the world combined. They have offices all over the world. And if you want to know more about it or contact Conica Minolta, simply go to mediaglobeplanetarium.com. That's all you have to do. And there you will have to go to the website. But uh, MTE, uh, we're really excited about the kind of things they're going to bring to this. So how am I doing on time? No, but uh, I'm sorry, comment I saw. What plant terms can use right now is a really great comment. How many minutes? Good. All right, comment I saw. Uh, uh, and uh, we talked a little bit about that. Uh, I know that uh, uh, Alan did a program on it. And I want to talk just a little bit about what this could mean. This is. Um, my first comment that I ever really observed in any detail, this is a Kiyosiki. It's from a coronagraph the Japanese took of it. And this uh, particular nucleus of this comet was only about two kilometers in diameter. Uh, right now the estimate on ISON is about five. So it's bigger. And it also passed much closer. These comets pass within the, the Roche limit, and when they do, they often break up. But it has to do with the cohesion of the nucleus itself, so it's hard to tell whether or not it's going to break up or not. But a Kiyosiki was stunning, and, and um, I think that it would be safe to say that there's a good possibility, I'd say at least a 70 to 80% possibility, that common ISON will indeed exceed a Kiyosiki. Okay? Now, I, Alan and all the people are very conservative about this. I got news for you. It's going to be out of your hands. <laughs> you're, you're going to be reacting to this. Um, going back to what Alan talked about is that uh, I make ISON brighter. You can build comets. I'm using a media Love software, by the way, to do this. And I, I built the comet ISON much brighter than it really is, so you can see it in this room. But um, this is roughly uh, on October 1st. Why October 1st? That's the day that I would make my decision. Am I going to jump off this cliff and tell everybody this is going to be the greatest thing in the world? Or I'm going to commit suicide and just hide somewhere? <laughs> and my reasoning for this is this is that also that's the same day that it passes by Mars. And JPL is right now planning and looking at the whole idea of using uh, rovers and orbiters to go ahead and also photograph. What this means is that it's really a test for another thing that's going to happen in 2014, uh, spring sightings comet. But, but what this means is that it's going to be all over CNN and all over Fox and all over newspapers. And whether you like it or not, you're going to have to take a position. Yeah. Comet Ison. Okay, so let's talk a bit about it. We know it's in Leo uh, in the east. Um, we know it's going to be right next to Mars. So an idiot can really find it. Uh, really? Because if you can teach, you can find that. You can find Mars. You can find Ison. Because in a pair of binoculars, wow. it's going to be something like this. Uh, it's estimate, uh, the most conservative estimate, that this will be ninth magnitude. In a pair of 7 by 50s dark sky, you should be able to see it. If you don't see it, jump off the cliff and say, I think it's not going to be much of a comet. <laughs> but if you can see it with a pair of binoculars as a test on, the, on October 1st, I think we've got a real comet. So what does this mean? Well, uh, on October 1st, it's going to fly by Mars. Uh, I'm going to move through here. Um, uh, on the 28th, it's going to reach its closest approach. It's going to reach within the Roche limit. All hell's going to break loose. Wait a minute, Roche limit of what? The huh? The Roche sun. limit of the sun. The sun. Yes. And, and so we'll see whether or not it survives or not. But the fact that it's over two and a half times the size of Kiyosiki uh, is very encouraging. Hayakutaki, by the way, was only two kilometers. Now, Hailbot was 60 kilometers. But, but, but nevertheless, most of the sun grazers, the Soho comets, they're like 10 to 20 meters in diameter. So I'm really kind of encouraged as an observer. So what is it going to look like? I've put everybody in the northeast. Uh, I would say around the 6th, 7th of December is really going to be probably the first really good time. 
Uh, my common model shows all kinds of dust production. It's going to be pretty cool. I've got to go in here. So I'm going to keep going. It's 1217, 1222. It's moving. It's now on 12, it's becoming circumpolar. It's going to move right by uh, into uh, Ursa Minor. And around the first, about the seventh, eighth, it's going to be very close to Polaris. What that means is photography-wise, again, anybody can photograph this comet. If you've ever done circumpolar photography or something near the pole, you don't have to have a, you don't have to have anything mounted. Just take the camera, lock it down, take a minute exposure. You're going to get a comet picture. So this is a great opportunity to do that. All right, let me move on here. A really good friend of mine, and I'm not dropping names, <laughs> died uh, last year, and I didn't want to see it happen without someone saying something about it. Ray Bradbury died last June. Uh, and uh, he, he and I first met in the library when I read his books, <laughs> when I was 10 and 12. I, and uh, he helped me through so many things about understanding death and so on, and, and all his books like Dandelion Line Wine and Something Wicked This Way Comes and so on. And, but I got a chance to meet him when I went to, to JPL to watch the first landing image on Mars, and I got a chance to actually sit next to him. So uh, here's a guy that I had read all my life and I got to so I got to, got to know him. Now the problem uh, with uh, JPL was that there were, this was the, the lander imaging team. And of course you can see this one person right here that many of you know, Carl Sagan. Now uh, I don't have time because of the interest here, but I will tell you a story in the, tonight, I promise, how I got Carl Sagan thrown out of JPL. <laughs> <laughs> I actually became good friends with Carl too, but uh, this is the, the Roy Neal of NBC, this is a, uh, Ray and, and Carl doing a little stand-up piece here. This is what it looks like uh, on TV. Notice that you didn't have to worry about whether you wore pants when they matched. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'll be in the interest of time, but I, this is what I want to get to. Uh, it, strong education is an elephant. Kim Small did a great job telling you one part of the elephant. Now I'm going to take another part. Well, I'm going to let Ray Bradbury do this. And if this pisses you off, good. <laughs> this is an actual quote from a Caltech commencement speech. Anyway, along the way, I worked for the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C. They were putting on a planetarium show with astronomy, of course, but they were boring the hell out of the people. They took me in to see a show, and within 10 minutes, everybody was asleep. You could hear snoring all over the planetarium. Now, we've all been here, by the way. I know. <laughs> and they took me back to the office. And the head of the Smithsonian said to me, what are we doing wrong? I said, my God, do you know what you're doing in there? You're teaching with this planetarium instead of preaching. A planetarium is a synagogue, a church, a basilica. It's a place to celebrate the universe and the incredible fact of our being alive in this world. He hated planetariums. I, I was a very good friend of him, but he hated, he never liked one, never went to a show, he, didn't, he just thought they were terrible. And then I went, I took it all at all this. Yeah. <laughs> and, and we are, we're all like this. And I'm talking to superintendents, I probably talk to 15 to 20 superintendents a year who want to close my attorneys. And I try my best to stop them from doing it. But why they're doing it is because we think that we value ourselves by how well we meet these. Nothing could be further from the truth. American, Scientific American, to attract more girls to STEM, bring more stelling, storytelling to science. This is in the April issue. You should read this article because it is about planetariums. Because all you have to do is this. To attract more people to your planetarium, bring more storytelling to your science. I'm running out of time here. I'm going to really end on this. The purpose of the planetarium is to inspire. We've heard that all before. Visitors explore the real sky phenomena for the rest of their lives. That's important, by the way, the rest of their lives. We do this by sharing our own passion, not some curriculum director somewhere. Our own passion for the heavens. We do this through dramatic storytelling and awe-inspiring audio and visual experiences that cannot be easily duplicated in any classroom. 90% of what I see you doing right now, if you did it in a classroom, I said you had to do it, I guarantee you the test results would be as good. Think about that. No single, single standard says you have to do it in the planetarium. Why would they write anything for you? Don't get indignant. Do something different. So anyhow, the collective purpose is to create 
and our students, visitors love astronomy, night sky, passion for Earth and planetary sciences, a thirst for exploration of the solar system. Our real job is not to merely meet science standards, but to create something infinitely more valuable. A country of lifelong learners and citizens who value science not as just a necessity, but a thing of beauty. If our work in our communities is merely to determine whether or not we meet some arbitrary science standard, then we are doomed. We can, for all practical purposes, be replaced with a far less expensive classroom, and I'll prove it to you tonight. As Bradbury astutely scorns us, you're teaching with this planetarium instead of preaching. A planetarium is a synagogue, a church, a basilica. It's a place to celebrate the universe and the incredible fact of our being alive in the world. Thank you.